Hello and welcome to this edition of World at War. My name is Mohammed Saleh. War and conflict do not knock on the door. They have this habit of exploding at a time when no one expects it. The Iranians have a reputation of being master diplomats. But on the 16th of January, Iran resorted to the military option, carrying out missile and drone strikes inside Pakistan. Pakistan, that claimed to be both surprised and incensed, retaliated with missile strikes of its own inside the Iranian territory. The two Muslim-majority nations are geographical neighbours. Pakistan has a Sunni majority, while Iran has a Shia majority. But this is not a sectarian conflict. What has baffled people around the world is why Iran chose to carry out missile and drone strikes inside the Pakistani territory. And even though the two nations on the face of it now say that they've managed to de-escalate tensions, the fact is the burning issue of Baloch separatism that is at the heart of this conflict still threatens to spark a bigger conflagration. This is the desolate region in the Panjgur district in Pakistan that was struck with missiles and drones by Iran on the night of the 16th of January. Two children were killed, while three other people sustained injuries. Pakistan is a nuclear power with a formidable stockpile of missiles and other weapons. But that did not deter Iran from making the first strike on its neighbour in a flare-up the like of which has never been witnessed between these two nations. Iran's first explanation was that it had warned Pakistan beforehand over the issue of Baloch separatists finding refuge in Pakistan. But Pakistan was apoplectic. It immediately recalled its ambassador from Tehran, told the Iranian ambassador who had gone back home to not return and suspended all high-level engagements with Iran. Pakistan reserves the right to respond to this illegal act and the responsibility for the consequences will lie squarely with Iran. We have conveyed this message to the government of Iran. Within 48 hours of the Iranian attack, Pakistan retaliated with several missiles that it fired into the Iranian city of Sarawan. This is the first time since the brutal Iran-Iraq war of the 1980s that any nation had struck Iran with missiles. Nine people, including four children, were killed in these Pakistani strikes. Iran insists the targets that it struck inside Pakistan were those of a terror outfit called Jaish al Adl, a Sunni Baloch separatist group that has managed to carve out bases on the Pakistani side of Balochistan. The deadly attack that took place in Kerman, in which about 83 Iranians were killed, is suspected to have been carried out by the ISIS on the fourth anniversary of Qasem Soleimani's assassination. Jaish Ladl, the Baloch separatist outfit, is accused of being linked with the ISIS, which is what many suspect forced the Iranian hand in carrying out this attack on Pakistan. But this week, Iran has been on a missile firing spree, striking targets in neighbouring Iraq and even in Syria. Iran and Pakistan managed to de-escalate pretty quickly, but to expect that permanent peace will now prevail along the fractious Iran-Pakistan border is a tenuous expectation. American President Joe Biden is urging the top American lawmakers to approve $60 billion of military aid to Ukraine. But consider the irony. The United States of America has been the biggest backer of the Ukrainian war effort in the last 22 months of the Russian invasion. But in the last one month, there hasn't been a single meeting at the Pentagon to decide what weapons need to be sent to Ukraine from the American Defense Department's weapons stockpile. And the reason the Joe Biden administration is giving is that it has run out of money. But a lack of American funds on the battlefield does not mean that the war has ended for Ukraine. The bitter winter has set in. The Russian President Vladimir Putin appears to be sensing his advantage. On the question of negotiations and peace talks, Putin continues to insist that there is absolutely no way that Ukraine, backed by the West, can now oust the Russians from the territory that has been captured. Our next board gets you more details. A thick blanket of snow has covered the battlefield. 
the brutal winter has made life hard. The Ukrainians are running out of funds, but the intensity of the war has not subsided. If anything, the onset of winter has heightened the intensity of the war. In the past week, the Russians claim to have hit an ammunition depot and a surface to air missile launcher in Dnipro Petrovsk. They also claim to have repulsed Ukrainian attacks in places such as Donetsk, Kupiansk, and Hassan. There are tit for tat attacks that are taking place throughout the front lines. And now, Kyiv claims it has proof that the Russians are raining down North Korean made weapons on Ukrainian positions. Dmitry Chubenko, the spokesperson for Kharkiv's prosecutor's office, shows the wreckage of a missile that he insists is of North Korean origin. This missile is similar to one of North Korean missiles. I am not going to name the exact type. However, according to information that is publicly available on the internet, the images that depict the North Korean parades, the nozzles and the rear part are very similar. And in fact, that North Korean missile type was developed on the base of Russian Iskander missiles, which is why they are so similar. That is why we are leaning towards the version that this may be a missile which was supplied by North Korea. Russia is using weapons sent in from its allies such as Iran and North Korea. But at the same time, is ramping up its defense production. Unlike Kyiv, that is scrapping at the bottom of a barrel to fight the war. Moscow, by picking holes in the Western sanctions, appears well-funded, and that confidence is reflected in Vladimir Putin's rhetoric. So if it goes on the way it is now, if the current situation continues, it is quite obvious not only Ukraine's counter-offensive has failed, but the initiative is completely in the hands of the Russian armed forces. If this continues, Ukrainian statehood may suffer an irreparable, very serious blow. As for negotiations process, it is an attempt to make us refuse those gains we have achieved for last one and a half years. It is impossible. Everyone understands it is impossible and they, the Ukraine ruling circles, understand it. And Western elites understand it. Everyone understands. Moscow has also accused French mercenaries of fighting for Ukraine. The Russian Defense Ministry claims that about 60 French mercenaries have been killed in the battlefield. France has rubbished these claims. Speaking at the World Economic Forum in Davos, the French President Emmanuel Macron insisted that the West must simply not allow Russia to win. First, we are going to do everything to try to hold the world together and not give in to the risk of division and try to have an effective agenda that will ensure that Russia cannot and must not win in Ukraine. Because what is at stake in Ukraine is our values, our collective security in Europe, in the Caucasus and in the entire region. Therefore, to do this, 2024 will be a key year for Europeans. Russian victory will change the security calculus of Europe. Washington's security interests are proving to be different from the security interests of European capitals. So even as Joe Biden is being accused of quietly letting Ukraine sink, question is, are the European nations on their own to take on an increasingly assertive Russia in the days to come? The United States of America on the 17th of January put the Iran-backed Houthi rebels back on the list of terror entities. The redesignation of the Houthis as a specially designated global terror group will be effective in about a month's time, that is from the 16th of February. This is the latest attempt by Washington to try and stem the attacks against commercial shipping in the Red Sea corridor. The defiant Houthis, though, after the announcement, have vowed to continue with their attacks that they say are in support of the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, where Israel is engaged in an offensive. The Houthi campaign in the Red Sea has disrupted global commerce. It has stoked fears of inflation and has also given rise to concerns that the fallout of the Israel-Hamas war could actually end up destabilizing the whole of the Middle East. Now, interestingly, the United States has also said that if the Houthis seize their attacks in the Red Sea and in the Gulf of Aden, 
then Washington will be quick to reevaluate this redesignation. Now, describing the American strikes on Houthi targets as defensive, Washington has categorically reiterated that they're not seeking a war with the Houthis. But the big question is this when the push comes to shove, can the United States even defeat the Houthis? The Houthis, officially known as Ansarallah, which translates to Partisans of God, originated as a theological movement preaching tolerance and peace in the early 1990s. The Iran-backed rebel group, which considers Israel as an enemy, now find themselves at the centre of an international conflict. Following the start of the Israel-Hamas war in the Gaza Strip, they started firing drones and missiles towards Israel, most of which were intercepted. Changing tactics in November, they started targeting Israeli-owned, flagged or operated ships or ships heading to the Israeli ports. However, many of the ships targeted had no connections with Israel. Consequently, major shipping companies stopped using the Red Sea route and instead were forced to use the much longer route around southern Africa. Almost 15% of global seaborne trade usually passed through the Red Sea. In response, the US and UK carried out multiple rounds of airstrikes on the Houthi targets in Yemen. Reportedly, 60 targets across 28 sites were hit, but the Houthis remained defiant and the attacks on vessels persisted. On Wednesday, they were redesignated as a global terrorist group by the United States. Earlier today, the Secretary of State announced the designation of the Houthis as a specially designated global terrorist, effective February 16th for threatening the security of the United States. Interestingly, in 2021, U.S. President Joe Biden's administration removed his predecessor, Donald Trump's last-minute designation of the Houthis as both a foreign terrorist organization and a specially designated global terror group. The redesignation now is aimed at cutting off funding and weapons the Houthis have employed to attack or hijack ships in the vital Red Sea shipping lanes. But barely hours after the US redesignated the Houthis, the rebels attacked a US ship with a drone of Yemen. The naval forces of the Yemeni armed forces carried out a targeting operation against the US vessel Genko Picardi in the Gulf of Aden with a number of appropriate naval missiles. And the strike was accurate and direct, thanks to God. U.S. President Joe Biden has acknowledged that the Americans and British bombardment has so far failed in its objective of stopping attacks by the Houthis on vessels in the Red Sea. Washington nonetheless plans to continue the attacks and hold the Houthis accountable for their actions, but not at the expense of Yemenis. But it's easier said than done since the Houthi rebels effectively govern vast areas of Yemen, including the capital Sana'a. It's a complicated mix and a single misstep could result in a major catastrophe. Once a bastion of peace in Latin America, Ecuador has been plunged into crisis after years of unchecked mushrooming influence of transnational narco gangs who use its ports to ship cocaine to the United States and Europe. It suffered a recent surge in violence that was triggered by the 7th of January prison escape of one of the country's most powerful narco bosses, Jose Adolfo Macias, better known by his alias, Fito. The newly elected president, Daniel Naboa, has declared a 60-day of state emergency. But the gangs have retaliated with their own declaration of war on the state. In 30 different attacks across the country, more than 200 prison staff were taken hostage. Bombings took place in several cities and even a state-owned television station was attacked during a live broadcast. In an intimidatory tactic, the public prosecutor who was investigating the dramatic attack was gunned down by the criminal gangs on the 17th of January in Guayaquil, which is now rapidly gaining notoriety as the most dangerous city in Ecuador. Our next report gets you more details. <laughs> The 
Barely two months into his term, 36-year-old Ecuadorian president Daniel Noboa finds himself at the center of an all-out war between the government and the powerful narco gangs. On Wednesday, in a brazen attack undoubtedly meant to convey a message or two, the public prosecutor Cesar Suarez, investigating a dramatic attack on the set of a public television channel, was shot to death in Guayaquil. Prosecutor Cesar Suarez, who in the past had carried out other high-profile investigations, was shot while driving to a court hearing. In view of the murder of our colleague Cesar Suarez, prosecutor of the National Unit specialized in investigations against transnational organized crime in Guayas, I am going to be emphatic. Organized crime groups, criminals, terrorists will not stop our commitment with the Ecuadorian society. We will continue with more strength and commitment. This isn't the first time the gangs have targeted a prosecutor. In June last year, Leonardo Palacios was mowed down in the town of Duran, near Guayaquil. And a year earlier, in 2022, two prosecutors and a judge had been shot dead. In connection with the murder of the prosecutor Suarez, two men have been apprehended. Noteworthy is the fact that Prosecutor Suarez was also in charge of Metastasis' case involving an Ecuadorian drug lord, who allegedly received favorable treatment from judges, prosecutors, police officers and high-ranking officials. The prosecutor had been put in charge of finding the gang responsible for the terror-inspiring attack on the state-owned TC television network on the 8th of January in the port city of Guayaquil. Hooded assailants armed with guns and explosives had stormed the TV station, firing gunshots and forcing staff to lie on the ground. The mayhem continued for 30 minutes when police entered the studio and arrested 13 assailants, many of whom were barely out of their teens. Ecuador over the past five years has become a hub for the global export of cocaine from neighbors Colombia and Peru. In a country of about 17 million people, there are more than 20 criminal gangs, in excess of 20,000 members in all. The government last week had declared war on powerful drug gangs, who in turn retaliated with a wave of attacks which left about 20 people dead. I stand also in solidarity with the families, but we are in a state of war. We are in a state of war and we cannot give in to these terrorist groups. Will Naboa, who had pledged to curb violence of narco gangs in his election campaign, succeed in his fight against narco gangs? A panic-stricken, anxious nation where the murder rate has quadrupled in the last five years awaits. The Union of the Comoros is an island nation along East Africa. It happens to be one of the poorest nations in the world. 45% of its 870,000 population languishes below the poverty line. The impoverished country has witnessed more than 20 coups and attempted coups post gaining independence in 1975. On the 14th of January, the first round of presidential elections were held to select the national leader from six candidates for the next five years. And the incumbent president, the former coup leader Azali Asumani, emerged victorious, but the poll was marred by opposition claims of ballot rigging and also a very low turnout. Now, barely two days after the announcement of the re-election of Asumani, there were street battles between soldiers and angry opposition supporters that erupted. At least one person was killed and six others were wounded, apparently shot by live rounds. Our next sport gets more details. The Electoral Commission of Comoros announced on Tuesday that the incumbent president, 65-year-old Azali Usumani, had garnered 63% of the votes in Sunday's ballot, thereby securing a fourth term as president.
The declaration triggered violent protests the next day after opposition parties cried foul, terming the results fraud and demanding an annulment. Several roads in the capital, Moroni, were barricaded and an unspecified number of protesters apprehended. To curb the spreading unrest, a nighttime curfew was imposed. Despite the preventive measures, buildings were vandalized, looted and set ablaze, including the home of a minister. A car at the home of another minister was set on fire and a national food depot was burned down during the protests. The city of 100,000 wore a deserted look on Thursday, aside from the street fighters. Interestingly, street protests are banned in Comoros, in a bid to prevent demonstrators from communicating and sharing information on social media, internet services were cut off by the authorities. On Thursday, the health officials reported the first casualties of the protests, one of them a seven-year-old child. For today, we have seven admissions due to the demonstrations including a little seven-year-old child who is not seriously injured because he was sent home. But the six other, it was probably by gunshot. And there is one dead, like you said, with serious head trauma, probably by gunshots. The opposition Orange Party has dubbed the protest a spontaneous uprising against autocratic rule claiming that they were not behind the protests, as alleged by the president's camp. The opposition claimed to have no role in the organization of the protests, but stood in solidarity with the protesting youths. It is to be noted that the unexpected low 16% turnout figure in the presidential vote falls way short of the figure for the parallel governor polls. If we look at these results, how we can understand in a coupled election, you vote at the same time for the governor and the president of the republic, and those who voted for the governor of Grand Comoros, 125,000, and when we look at those who voted for the president, nationally 55,000. How can we understand this? Because there were jams, they committed fraud. Osumani's victory is expected to be confirmed by the Comoros Supreme Court at the weekend. In 2018 as well, the former military chief of staff turned civilian ruler had pushed through a constitutional reform allowing him to centralize powers. Many of his opponents have been jailed or exiled. The million dollar question is, will Osumani return for a third consecutive term and remain in power till 2029? and extend his increasingly autocratic grip over the country. And with that's a wrap on this edition of World at War. And if you want to reach out to me with any comments, feedback or suggestions, please feel free to do so on the RD that you're seeing on your screens. I'm your host, Mohammed Saleh, and I'll see you again next week.